All right. We would like to thank everyone for being here this afternoon. Uh, as you can see behind myself here, there are many individuals uh, representing many different agencies throughout the state and throughout the nation uh, who are willing and ready to speak and are, are here to express uh, really their concern for what has happened here recently. Uh, so as in the other press conferences, uh, we will go ahead and allow each speaker to say what they're going to say and after which we'll go ahead and have a brief opportunity for some questions uh, before we have a one-on-one -on -one breakout and we end the press conference. So let us please all hold questions until after each speaker has had their opportunity and that will help things to flow more smoothly. So now let's go ahead and start with the Ridgecrest Police Department, Chief McLaughlin. Man, there's no more room on this. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of people that care about this community by those that stand behind me. And uh, you guys are here to uh, obviously not see me. So we uh, reported earlier that it is hard for the world to see how we are feeling and how we felt over these past few days. Uh, I've had the opportunity to show the governor Cal OES and uh, the dignitaries that stand behind me, some of what we've been experiencing, because it is internal, not only internal personally for myself and our community, our buildings and everything around us. It is hard to see from the outside. So uh, I hope that they've taken that opportunity and they've, they've been given that sample of what we've been going through for these past few days. So with that, I will uh, turn it over. Our next speaker will be City of Ridgecrest Mayor Breeden. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome, Governor. Thank you for being here. He called me the morning right after the quake, and he said, what can I do? How can I help? I'm here. And naturally, I thought, OK, those are great political words. I will never hear or see from this man again. Wow, was I wrong. Here he is. He's offering help. He's giving us ideas. And he said, I'm going to bring a team up that will make this happen. And so with no further ado, you don't want to hear me. You want to hear the man. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker will be Cal OES direct, Director Mark Gillarducci. All right, I'm going to say a few words so you can get to the governor. Um, I'm Director of Governor Newsom's Office of Emergency Service. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the state's response and support of the city of Ridge, uh, uh, Ridgecrest and, and, um, and Kern County. Uh, actually, shortly after the, the magnitude 6.4, um, we uh, were working with the city and the county, deploying a lot of mutual aid assets from throughout the Southern California area. And you really cannot say uh, enough about all of the support from uh, the various fire agencies and other law enforcement and public safety agencies uh, that supported the call for mutual aid uh, from urban search and rescue capabilities, the fire strike teams, to hazmat teams uh, that we were able to bring in in support of uh, the first quake. And then, again, when the 7.1 occurred, um, uh, accelerating those resources and increasing the number of, uh, of mutual aid assets, but also uh, supporting with state assets from the California Highway Patrol, the California National Guard, uh, CAL FIRE, um, Department of Public Health, uh, to make sure that all of the different aspects uh, that were needed to uh, deal with the immediate aftermath and the public health issues and the search and rescue issues and the fire suppression issues uh, were addressed. Um, understand the State Operations Center in Sacramento is at the highest level of activation, uh, and we've got uh, thousands of, uh, of other local and then state and federal uh, partners. Uh, uh, very early on, FEMA uh, got engaged with us, and um, uh, the, 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 the governor did pro proclaim a state of emergency uh, almost immediately after the 6.4, uh, 
and then ratified it again in the 7.1, ensuring that that opened the pathway for all assets, but also uh, uh, made the request uh, to the White House for uh, direct federal assistance. And, and FEMA has been with us every step of the way, and we're very appreciative of that. Um, we'll continue to uh, be here for the long term, now transitioning from response into recovery uh, and beginning to do damage assessment throughout the area, working with the city and the county um, uh, and, and the base uh, to look at what the damages look like and how best we can uh, work to be able to address both individual needs and uh, infrastructure damage, public uh, losses uh, across the region. Um, so uh, with that, I'm um, uh, happy to now introduce our governor, uh, Governor Gavin Newsom. Thank you, Mark. And um, thank you all very much for all your coverage um, and your I think, participation in the reality in the last 48 hours. It's been extraordinary, uh, not only for all of us uh, here in California, but I imagine for people around the world wondering what's happening in the state. Uh, it's been a remarkable many months in California. I just got off the phone five minutes ago, quite literally five minutes ago with the president, uh, just reflecting on the fact six months ago we were battling a fire in Northern California, the Camp Fire in Butte County, and battling fires at the same time concurrently uh, down in Southern California, the Woolsey Fire, uh, now earthquakes. Uh, as a former mayor of San Francisco, it's a fourth generation Californian and San Franciscan, earthquakes are as familiar to me as uh, they are, I think, now to everybody down here. Uh, the flag of San Francisco is a, a phoenix rising that came out of the ashes of the 1906 earthquake. And the phoenix rising is symbolic because San Francisco rose from those ashes and it became stronger, more resilient city as a consequence of people uh, committing to each other, committing to a sense of community, uh, committing uh, to their city and the state and this nation collectively who we are as a people. And I think that resiliency, that same level of commitment is demonstrable when you walk around this community. I've had the privilege of spending time with the mayor, uh, with your district attorney, with your police chief, and many other leaders, city administrator, to city uh, council members, members of the board of supervisors I've had the chance to talk with. Uh, people are more resolved than ever to rebuild, but rebuild uh, with an enlightened sense of what this community can be moving forward. And I think some of the most interesting conversations we had were in that spirit. How can we be stronger? How can we be better? How can we be more self-reliant, not just more resilient as a community? And our expression was one of commitment, not interest, in helping support uh, that cause. Uh, as the director said, uh, we're now moving in a new phase. Uh, but for me, uh, this phase extends beyond just the immediate term, the next few days, the next few weeks, as all of you move on and the cameras move on as we move from another natural disaster, and maybe man-made disaster, uh, the community here is going to, I think, rightfully expect that the state of California has their back, that the federal government has their back. There's no doubt in my mind, after talking with the president, he's committed in the long haul, in the long run, to help support the rebuilding efforts. Uh, we are as a state as well. Uh, and so I'm here in that spirit, spirit of gratitude, spirit of respect for the leadership assembled behind me, to the first responders, uh, many of them uh, that are getting their first hot meal. Uh, many of them haven't seen their kids, many of their kids who haven't seen their parents that are in shock, quite literally in shock, because they're scared to death to go back home and tell mom or dad, get back home uh, and make them feel safe. To all of those folks out here, uh, across not only this city uh, and this remarkable naval base, by the way, a naval base, for those that are not familiar, uh, a, a naval base that's larger than any other land na naval base anywhere in the Navy's portfolio. A third of the land mass of the Navy uh, exists just here in this community. You want to talk about a patriotic community. You want to talk about a community completely tied on the 4th of July to the values and principles of patriotism and love of the flag. Come here on 9-11 when they do the memorial, the remembrance, and thousands of flags are, are lined up here. The idea this happened on 4th of July and happened right here uh, with the community that really is connected uh, to our armed forces also is a, is a remarkable thing. And just a, it's a point of spirit 
It's a point of pride uh, that sort of extends uh, to this community, extends to our commitment to this community, not just as a state, but I hope as a nation as well. So uh, again, uh, thank you uh, to all of the extraordinary work uh, of uh, the first responders. Thank you as well in closing uh, to the community. I uh, just was out at the mobile home park. Many of you have been out to the mobile home park. It's interesting, I was up in a Napa earthquake. Some of the most significant devastation occurred there. It's a socioeconomic issue as well for many uh, that don't have the means or mechanisms to, to go once they're red tagged. They don't have a place to go. They don't have, in many cases, family members. Uh, but that sense of community was alive and well there. Uh, and it was wonderful to see. And so, again, just know California is committed to rebuilding. Uh, California is committed uh, to this region. And California is committed, in closing, to do more to raise consciousness and awareness around the fact that our beauty, California's extraordinary beauty, is defined in many respects by seismology and by these quakes. There's a reason these mountain ranges are here. Uh, there's a reason uh, California uh, is what it is. And so the folks in Los Angeles that I know aren't sleeping as well over a two-night period, uh, we all have an opportunity now to get more prepared, to be more vigilant, to look at our building codes, look at our home hardening, to look at that alert system. And I'm happy to answer any questions about what the state will be doing and has been doing on a state overlay on an early warning system, which we are fully committed to and is a lot farther along than some actually may believe. Uh, we all, I think, have a unique role and responsibility to prepare individually to be prepared for the next earthquake of magnitude even greater than 7.1. So thank you all for being here. And we happily, this is the moment, will take any questions and any of us here, including Commissioner of CHP and General Baldwin of the National Guard are all here to answer any of your questions. You said you spoke with President Trump five minutes ago. What promise or pledge or declaration did he give? Just commitment, whatever you need. No, it's the words I'm familiar with. The president made those commitments, and for folks in Butte County, made those commitments to folks down in Woolsey, and uh, he's fulfilled that commitment. Uh, there's no question, any of you, you've all written and run these stories. We don't agree on everything, but one area where there's no politics, where we've worked extraordinarily well together, is on emergency uh, response and recovery uh, and increasing that emergency preparedness. And uh, this is. Uh, this is consistent with that relationship, and I want to thank the President uh, for his outreach, but more importantly, for FEMA. And we have our regional director of FEMA, who happens to interestingly live, Bob, in San Francisco, um, and he represents this region. We're getting to know each other well uh, because of all these fires and now these earthquakes, uh, and FEMA has just been extraordinary, and that's an extension of our federal administration. What Job you, well done. What did you see on the tour, and did you speak to any residents? Yeah. We spoke to the residents, but what we saw on the tour is exactly what the police chief said. We saw what many people don't see, and that's what resides inside. Uh, the chief has made this point to you over the course of the last few days. I've watched it. I've heard it. He's made it privately in the car as we were touring around. You don't notice the damage until you open that door. We were, forgive me, or for those at Sears, they're happy to hear it. Uh, you know, you walk into that Sears, uh, and we were with the gentleman that uh, runs it. He says, this was the damage on Thursday. This was the damage on Friday. And you walk uh, into Sears, you wonder if there's any damage at all. Right when you open those doors, you see something very differently. Go to the mobile home park, the same thing. Red tags are there for a reason. Uh, you see a few bricks down, but you don't see what's behind those doorways. So uh, folks were making that point, not only first responders and your leaders here, but also the community leaders. It was interesting, just at the mobile home park, they were very pleased that the water was on, but they said, slow down on getting the gas back on, just because, you know, this is a challenging time for us and we're a little nervous about what's going on. It's just, that's the ebb and flow of this moment. But most of the intersections are back up, not all of them. Uh, most of the roads, Caltran, our state transportation folks got those roads uh, back up. Uh, obviously, our two uh, investor-owned utilities, Edison and PG&E, uh, I think have done an admirable job over the course of the last 48 hours. A little bit more work to do. We were just down at the hospital. Um, thank you, Jim, and his team down there. Heroic job. That's always the toughest job. And they're battling. You know, someone said, boy, Jim, you walk on water, and 
we quite literally were walking on water because it was flooding still in there and they got to clean up the water. But uh, that's, uh, that's the spirit. Everybody rowing in the right direction. People haven't slept, people doing their job in yeah, incredible Peter, ways. I spoke to, uh, since we're talking about damage, I spoke to a mobile home owner whose uh, mobile home was knocked off the uh, support structure and he got an estimate that it might cost about $10,000 to fix. Yeah. And he says he's not looking for a handout, but he's, he's hoping that there might be low interest loans available to white victims. Is there someone who can address the likelihood of yeah. uh, that kind of uh, Yeah, way? I'm going to uh, allow someone to talk about that in more prescriptive terms. But I will say this, look, this is, this is the interesting differentiation between these wildfires uh, and what has occurred here, is most folks let's be candid, don't have earthquake insurance because they can't afford it, or they just are unwilling to spend the money because the deductibilities are so high. And so in many of these cases, uh, that is a huge out-of-pocket expense. Business interruption, obviously a consequence of someone in a mobile home park, imagine a $10,000 cost, uh, that's astronomical. Uh, so multiple things are happening, uh, and they're happening as they should uh, in a deliberative manner. You start with local and county, declarations of emergency. The state provides that overlay. Uh, the president and I just talked about the federal declaration of emergency, and then you move to the next phase of that declaration then that allows individuals to get benefits along the lines of the individual you talk to. So it's sequenced. I have all the confidence in the world uh, the president will be forthcoming in immediate terms uh, with the federal declaration. Uh, and then we will move on to the subsequent de declaration, uh, which will uh, be done after a very detailed inventory of all the damage. Now, quick point before I turn it over. Uh, we were having a conversation in the back, lessons learned around earthquakes in California. It's deceiving earthquake damage. You don't notice it at first. And so it's incumbent upon this community to go through a very detailed assessment of that damage. Uh, and we want to be here to help them with the paperwork, literally and figuratively, and to make sure that there's a professionalism in terms of how you assess that damage so that they are eligible for all the reimbursements. But as it relates to the broader emergency declaration and individuals getting that support, perhaps you can talk a little bit more about that. So the governor's right when he talks about uh, sequencing uh the initial uh, effort is really to do a damage assessment, and we will be uh, starting tomorrow going out and working with, uh, with the city and the community to be able to get a better assessment on uh, what we're looking at. Um, uh, part of what we will do is, is not only apply uh, for federal assistance through FEMA, but we will also be applying uh, for Small Business Administration uh, low interest loans. These are disaster <laughs> loans that are designed for just this purpose uh, to help individuals who may need a step up to be able to address that. So uh, the, the, as, uh, as the governor mentioned, as it goes through that process, um, uh, we hope to have uh, that damage assessment done here uh, within about a week's period or so, a week and a half, and then we'll be able to um, uh, move forward with uh, the applications for those assets. And Mark, talk a little bit about the disaster assistance that was also something through our disaster assistance acts. We're providing resources more broadly. So, so there's there's a couple of, at the state level. There are uh, a, there's a program called the California Disaster Assistance Act. It is really the governor's uh, uh, public assistance for infrastructure loss uh, and infrastructure damage. His program to be able to uh, support uh, local governments that may have sustained damage. This is for damage to critical infrastructure, roads, schools, hospitals, um, uh, uh, fire stations, et cetera, um, and, and also to help offset the cost of the response by all of the public safety officials that responded uh, to the earthquakes. And uh, uh, governor has already, as a part of um, uh, proclaiming the state of emergency, has invoked the California Disaster Assistance Act to make that funding available to the community. That also is, is sequenced in, with regards to us working with the city and the county and being able to uh, identify costs and, and, and move that forward. Let, one last thing I will say is this is a whole of community response. It's, it's not solely uh, a government. We also engage our, our partners in the private sector and we engage um, uh, the, the philanthropic and faith-based sectors. For example, uh, the Kern County Community Foundation has been stood up 
uh, and is accepting uh, um, uh, uh, funding to be able to help uh, uh, unmet needs or, or members that may not, or individuals that may not be able to meet uh, certain um, uh, government-related program. So we're going to work collectively with the city and county to ensure that the whole of community uh, engages in the overarching uh, response. And that's two counties and not just this city. We have not forgotten the smaller communities yes. that reside in and around uh, where we stand, and that's critical as well that we not forget those unincorporated parts. Governor, you're, uh, talking about, you're talking about the damage not being necessarily visible all the time. A lot of people in California are going to be looking at the pictures on TV of this thinking, hey, they essentially survived a 6.4 or a 7.1. What do you say to the people of this state about the dangers of complacency? Well, I mean, you've got to be prepared, but at the same time, uh, you know, I've lived through three or four quakes in my lifetime, and uh, I was there. At, I don't remember, give my address, but 15 Rico Way in the Marina District in San Francisco, walking out to watch the World Series, literally walking to my doorstep. It was 5 something p.m. in 1989, and that was a 6.9 quake. The idea that it, that's indelible in my mind. Uh, 7.1, I can't even imagine. Look, we can't be complacent. I remind people this all the time. My first, one of my first meetings was, Governor, I got sworn in. I said, we need to prepare for an earthquake. And this is not being precedent. This is just being a historian. It's a very predictor of the future, is the past. Uh, that's California. But, it, but, but it, I just want folks to know, I got a call, I'm not making this up for someone in Mongolia, a friend of mine, says, my gosh, everything's, are you guys all right? This, you know, felt the whole state had collapsed or something. You know, California is doing very well, folks. Uh, it's a remarkably large, diverse state, uh, and it has some of the toughest building codes in the world, post-2008. No state is doing more to secure its infrastructure. We just got to get in that old building stock and we got to prepare. And a part of that preparedness as well, in terms of being vigilant, is making sure that we get this early earthquake warning system up and running at a statewide level. 70% of it's done. Uh, we're putting the infrastructure in. It's not going to be done in 476 cities, 58 counties. It's got to be done at a statewide level. It's a partnership, uh, obviously, with USGS and Caltech, but also. Uh, UC Berkeley and the state itself. Uh, we're building out that infrastructure. Uh, the final infrastructure is being put in place. I think it'll be 1,100 uh, of uh, these pre-positioned size monitors or however, whatever the infrastructure nomenclature is, because there's multiple types that are being put into place. Uh, but know that we are committed to rolling that out uh, shortly. I don't want to overpromise when, uh, but also uh, it goes to where technology can also aid in terms of early warning. And in this case, not that interface that we've been talking about, which is with the public, but first with critical infrastructure, automatic shutoffs on train systems and rail systems, the ability with that early warning to recognize that we have to reconcile uh, the legitimate concerns around, you know, Aliso Canyon. I don't mean that as something everybody around Aliso Canyon should panic around, but large facilities to make sure uh, that we trigger uh, some, uh, well, some early warning, uh, as you've seen in other parts of the world. That's another uh, part of our effort to be vigilant, sort of business to business uh, and government to government, and then roll it out for the rest of the public. But were you surprised, compared to thinking about 1989, I was down at Northridge, 7-1, when you came into town, They've been telling us, you know, the damage wasn't as bad as expected. Did you expect to see more seven months? Yeah, I did, um, and I didn't. I remember sitting there in the Marina District. They said the entire bridge had collapsed. I was, I was living in the city, and I just assumed the bridge had collapsed. I, I was there in the middle of it. I was right there where those, those iconic buildings had buckled. I was walking right down the block. So I'd assume the rest of the city looked like that. I was amazed when I walked through the rest of the city that 99% of it was in pretty good shape. So we're remarkably resilient, even, you know, so we highlight the fire and everyone assumes everything's on fire. That's devastating for the individual's impact and the community impacted. But there's another story here, so yes and no. But I'll tell you, you get a 7-1 in and around Los Angeles, I see your hat. <laughs> uh, that's, that, that, that's of consequence where we're not talking about some small injuries, which is remarkable that there were no major injuries. We're talking about a magnitude of number of people have lost their lives and property damage in the billions, not the tens of millions uh, or low hundreds of millions. So, look, uh, we've got to be prepared. This is a wake-up call. 
not for this community, it's reality for this community, but it is a wake-up call for the rest of the state and for other parts of the nation that are not immune from the same kind of activity. Are you surprised there's not more damage from 7.1 quakes here? Yeah, I mean, after the 6.4, and then you impact that on top of 7.1, yeah, no question. I mean, you, we flew in here, and by the way, we flew in in the naval base. There's a lot of damage out there. I don't want to speak um, out of school on that, but I don't think there's any more important economic activity that could uh, be advanced than getting those folks back uh, to work and getting that base back up. I mean, I, I think, Mayor, what did you say? 86% of the economic activity is directly or indirectly tied uh, to that base. So we got to get that moving. But there is some damage that you may not have all had the privilege to see. Uh, that is, again, the point that needs to be reinforced. It's just not visible. Uh, but when you start opening those doors, you see a different picture. Is there someone who can address the, uh, the uh, damage on the base without giving away any secrets? And is there anyone who I'm sure there is, but I don't, you know, I don't want to speak for them. So, and but I, and you, he wants to keep his, his rank. I'm not sure he wants to, but maybe he was want to talk. Yeah. Forgive me for no, putting you in this spot. Thank you, David. Yeah. So, uh, Captain Paul Dale, Commanding Officer of Naval Air, Air, Naval Air Weapons Station, China Lake. Uh, so, we had initial assessments. We had moved from the recovery, or we had moved from the, uh, uh, into the recovery and cleanup phase after the 6.4. Now, after the 7.1 last night, we pretty much started over. Uh, we're transitioning now, just like was mentioned, for the, the uh, local area, the, the community, into that also recovery and cleanup phase. I don't have any specifics for you uh, because we continue to go through the damage, uh, initial damage assessments, and we have a large number of structural engineers that are on the installation right now making assessments and providing that information up to higher headquarters for further, uh, further decisions and uh, further assessments. Are there any explosives kept on the base secure? Say again? Are there any, any explosives that are kept on the base are they secure? So the, we do have weapons magazines on the installation because we are a naval air weapons station. So we have that uh, weapons aspect of our mission. And uh, yes, the, the uh, weapons are secure. Could you spell your name, please, sir? Uh, first name is Paul, last name is Dale, D-A-L-E. Governor, Governor, can we bring the chief just back up for a quick question on the community? Bring up the chief, and now we're ready for you after the chief. Chief, you, you've talked Forget quite us. movingly, I think, about the people not being able to see the damage that this has done. Mm -hmm. The mental wear and tear on the people who have gone through two big earthquakes. Can you put that into words? Uh, isn't it on my face? Mm -hmm. But uh, into words? Uh, I don't know what words would uh, that I could use for that right now. Um, I can give you a bunch of words that we've all gone through, horror, um, grief, um, shock, and, uh, and then for me, uh, pride in uh, what I've seen from here, my people. Um, so it's, a, it's been a vast uh, range of emotions. So, and I think the whole community is going through that. So I don't think I could pick one word. Yeah. And I imagine as a parent with children, and the younger you are, the more unnerved I imagine you may be by this experience. So the issues of behavioral health are important, and some of the assets that we are sending down uh, are around the issues of brain health. Uh, and being there to address some of those concerns as well. Okay, Governor, as, as a person from San Francisco who has experienced earthquakes, do you have any philosophical words of comfort for our community? Yeah. You're going to rebuild. You're going to be a stronger and better community. I don't think that. I know that. Uh, there, th th that's an evidence everywhere you go. That was an evidence when we landed the plane uh, by the folks that were out there and you know all the local CHP that were out there that came back uh, over the 4th of July weekend. They were gone and came back because they wanted to be there for their community. That spirit is alive here deeply. Uh, the folks, I mean, this is one of the most sophisticated communities in America. I mean, it, you got more PhDs here than probably, you know, students at Stanford. Um, you've got folks that, uh, that feel a great sense of place going back decades in the 1940s when that that base was conceived. 
um, and what it's represented to the world, not just America in terms of its defense. Uh, this is a special place. Uh, so I have no trepidation uh, about uh, this community building stronger. And in time, that will shock you. This is not 20, 30 years. I mean, I think this is going to turn around. You're going to be mesmerized uh, by how quickly we're able to come together and uh, how vibrant things will return. Excuse me. What's your message to the immigrant community, whether from this community or any other community that are affected by this set of circumstances that we're talking about? What is your Well, when it comes to emergency response, uh, we have no engagement as it relates to turning over information. You provide your information or ID. No one within our diverse communities should be concerned about that being used against them. I've seen this in the past. We were up there on that. We had an Orville Dam issue, uh, and we had some folks in shelters that weren't in shelters. They were sleeping outside, and there were empty shelter beds. said, what's going on? That's because there were some mixed status families and they were scared to death to go in because they were asking for IDs to make sure they were from the local community. I'd express that was not to use that information against you. It was just to make sure you were from the community impacted. In no way, shape, or form should people fear being part of a larger community, regardless of their status uh, as it relates to emergency response. Mr. Well, that's being assessed, and it's being assessed in detail, um, and it's being assessed uh, in a very, very deliberative way. Uh, not only prescriptively as it relates to what it takes to get reimbursements, not just from the state, but the federal government, but also as it relates to uh, individuals assessing their own damage for their own personal purposes. Uh, beyond that, in the immediate term, we have our general uh, Baldwin here from the National Guard. And they have 200 personnel uh, that are ready to engage as needed. Uh, CHP had 68 uh, staff members uh, that were out here in their position and has more. Uh, you know, as you need more, we're going to be there. Uh, we have all kinds of other resources, including a lot of federal resources from FEMA uh, that are being positioned and staged if this continues. Uh, so we're ready uh, to resource in the immediate term. In the longer term, uh, we were talking to some of your leaders, the mayor and others, uh, about how we can look at existing state pots of money and look at the rebuilding with a little bit more precision and strategic intent to focus on ways of magnifying those investments so that the community could be benefited in a more robust way than otherwise would be. So is that going to be the tens of millions that you made reference to earlier? Yeah, look, the damages are currently being assessed. Obviously, the fires and those a piece of the property that are completely lost. But your economic damage, well in north of $100 million, that was, that's an old number. You're going to get new numbers. Uh, as long as that naval base is closed, that's going to impact the community and economic spend profoundly. So all that will be assessed. All that will be considered as it relates to those insured, those without insurance, those with business loss insurance related not just to traditional earthquakes, but other mechanisms to which they get reimbursed. If you are a franchisee and owns a business, there's a relationship with a franchisee that can help share those costs and burdens. All this is, forgive me, all assessed on an individual uh, and a segmental basis. Uh, and all of that uh, will amount to tens of tens of millions of dollars. Governor, do you have a message for uh, anyone in the public, what they should be doing today as far as preparing for uh, an earthquake, a fire, or a dam break? Uh, you know, I, I said this ad nauseum. Prepare for the worst. Not because you want to experience the worst or should even expect it, but I talk about this notion of 72 hours. Worst case, where you're on your own for 72 hours, where you're working with your CERT teams and neighborhood emergency response teams, and you actually participate. Maybe it's an opportunity to volunteer for your uh, community emergency response team. Say, so, you know what, I'm going to spend that weekend learning CPR, I actually get to know my neighbors a little bit. Because in the most dire of circumstance, when you get you know, closer to that 1906 level, uh, it's unlikely that first responders are going to be there in those first few hours. They're going to do everything they can be, but the magnitude of those quakes are such that you need to prepare on your own. So it's more than just water uh, for your family, yourself. It's taking care of your pets. Everyone forgets their pets. We love our pets, but they're often not prepared for them. Uh, making sure that uh, you know the communication goes down. It didn't go down here. But if it does go down and you're 
daughters at school, your sons at camp, that you had some consideration that you can't just pick up your phone and all reconvene. And you think about, in a worst case scenario where we can't talk, we're gonna to go to this site because we've predetermined. Those are the kind of things, putting together those emergency plans on an individual basis based on your own circumstances, uh, I think is something everybody should do. That's the price of admission as a resident of California. Governor, I have a question. Uh, you testified briefly about help to the immigrant community. Mm -hmm. Some federal help, though, doesn't it have strings attached that people must be either a legal resident and no undocumented immigrants can apply for that federal aid? Yeah. Would uh, that be the case here? If federal money flows to California to help immigrants here, must they be legal residents or yeah. cannot be undocumented? So that's certainly the case in certain categorical funds. But what I'm talking about is just the emergency and recovery phase, that people should feel secure going to shelter. People shouldn't put themselves in harm's way. People should know they have the right and access to the emergency room, that they have those same opportunities as everybody else without fear. That's the most important thing. As it relates to those subsequent phases of where people are eligible for reimbursements, that's absolutely true. Uh, and one would have to navigate that on a case-by-case -case basis. The state does certain things, but the federal government undoubtedly uh, has different rules and regulations. But anybody who's coming from the state, would people that need to be uh, legal residents? Yeah, and Mark, you could talk more prescriptively, but that's when we move through this, this the immediate emergency phase and recovery phase. Uh, that's a different different place. So, so if I understand your question correctly, uh, you're talking about coming and getting state assistance. So um, uh, right now the state program uh, that we're, we're invoking is a public assistance program. This is focused immediately on public infrastructure damage. In other words, damage to roads, bridges, and, and the cost of responding to the emergency. Um, the state doesn't have, per se, an individual assistance program. So when I say whole of community, what we do is we invoke the larger community to bring to, to, the, to the, um, the state's response and recovery operation uh, those programs that aren't necessarily governmental. And when the governor speaks about the opportunity for all you know, uh, 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 demographics to be able to come in and get assistance, uh, when you come into the state, you, you, you have opportunity uh, to be able to access all of those programs. We will work with the city and the counties that have been impacted throughout the region to open up what's called a local assistance center. That local assistance center will have a variety of state and local programs, not necessarily federal yet, state and local programs, which will include philanthropic, faith-based, and other kinds of programs that every Californian or, or individual who has been impacted by the disaster can take uh, um, take an opportunity with. Regardless of their status. Regardless of their status. Last question, are we good? Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you guys.